good evening. And for those of us who are celebrating Passover already, happy uh, Pesach. Uh, Kirk and uh, JB, are you guys uh, going to begin uh, tonight or uh, tomorrow night? Uh, I will be doing it tomorrow night. Okay. I can support that. What about you, uh, Kirk? Uh, we were going to, but we also have some friends up here that um, are going to start tomorrow night, so we wanted to join in, so it will be a big family gathering, and uh, so we'll be sharing uh, PSOC with them tomorrow night. Okay, so you were thinking about tonight, and then you decided tomorrow night because uh, you have uh, Covenant uh, family uh, members in. Mm-hmm. Yes, sir. Yeah, I uh, I was in the same uh, boat in the sense that uh took the opposite course, but I think that's the uh, the joy of this whole thing. Uh and the uh, freedom we have in the whole thing. Uh, my uh, youngest son is a Covenant member, and he uh, is currently going to law school. Um, and he uh, called a few days ago and said, you know, I'd really like to uh, celebrate Pesach together. Um, it's a little easier for me to do it on Friday evening. Uh, if you can pick me up Friday and, and bring me back on Saturday morning than it is on Saturday, is there any way we can justify uh, Pesach uh, on Friday versus on Saturday. And, uh, you know, I looked at it again, and, well, I, I looked at, it looked to me like it was even Stephen. You could do a coin flip on this one. Yeah. And you could come mm-hmm. up with uh, with either day. And, you know, I told myself, you know, I think that since it's so close, and the fact that we can do it together, if uh, if I pick you up um, on, uh, on Friday uh, and we celebrate it Friday evening, that that's going to work out. That's going to be our best choice because it is about family. Yeah. So uh, yep. we uh, we uh, uh, barbecued our lamb tonight and uh, had our matzah and our red wine and our olive oil with uh, with bitter herbs and just had a grand time. Uh, Great. My little granddaughter was here and my uh, son and uh, and uh, daughter-in-law was here, uh, both sons. So um, you know what a uh, uh, what a delightful thing. And and uh, you know when I asked you guys what, what you're doing and you're both doing it tomorrow night. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I know there are uh, lots of people that uh, over time have been really uh, angry with me for suggesting that the timing of this was less important than the meaning of it. <laughs> and, you know, they say, you know, God has uh, his own timing, and who are you to change his I'm not changing his timing. <laughs> you know, he, he did not give us specific instructions as to how to uh, uh, discern the timing. I mean, it's it's pretty yeah. close. You know, he wants... He tells us that the uh, that barley will be a beeb, which means it's green and growing. That's really symbolic, though. That the flax mm-hmm. will begin to flower, which is a, a, an early spring flower, and that it's the renewing of the light on the moon uh, closest to those things, and that it's the 14th day of the month, and the 14th day of the month begins at sundown on the 13th day. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that's, that's going to get you really close almost all the time. But uh, mm-hmm. he did not say how much has to be seen, if it's observational or astronomical, and the difference being, you know, you can probably see one to two percent, maybe, of renewing light on the uh, on the moon, because anything less than that, you're you're looking into the sunset. Uh, yeah. You know, when you're trying to determine, you know, Pesach is a full moon, but. Um, the beginning First of the month, month is a new moon. It is a, is a renewing light on the moon. And I don't think you can see really more than uh, 1% to 2%. Just because you are looking into Right. You're looking into the sunset. It's uh, It always occurs very late uh, in the, uh, the afternoon, low on the horizon, where you have the most atmosphere to look through, the most potential for clouds and everything else. So God doesn't say, you know, when you can't see it, uh, you know, use your best guess and he doesn't say I want you to use the astronomical which means that even one one hundredth of one percent renewing light prior to the sunset I think it has to be prior to the sunset because you know the uh, the NASA models mm-hmm. present it prior to midnight you know it's it's uh, they tell you when the, the moon is going to set but they give you the percentage at the end of the day which would be midnight well you can't see it at midnight of course you only can see it as the sun is setting. Yeah. so um, I think there's a reason that Yahweh did not give us a means to precisely determine which day. Yeah. I think well, you, what do you do if it uh, happens to be a very stormy period of weather? You can't see yeah, a period. Right. You you might go right. three, four weeks without seeing 
You know, we are so. we um, just came through in uh, in um, Southwest Ohio. We just came through, as did much of the middle of the country, four days where we were considering building the ark. Mm-hmm. You know, it just rained <laughs> yeah. and rained and rained, and the sun finally broke out uh, this afternoon. It's the first time we've seen the sun in a week. So, <laughs> would it have been possible? Uh, you know, at uh, and and I want to tell you, uh, two weeks ago it was the same thing. So no, you couldn't see it. Yeah. So you know the the best you can do is uh, is you can choose, and what I do is uh, you know our good friend uh, Yoel uh, put together that that beautiful presentation that's the end of the Kara uh, invitations, uh, the last chapter of the invitations volume, the third volume of Yada Yada, and you can look at it and you can say, all right, this is the day that it's the, uh, that you have observational, this day is that's uh, that is um, astronomical. You can see exactly how much of the moon's light is going to be growing on the surface of the moon each uh, day as we uh, as we we uh, uh, look at the potentials for new moons. And in fact, there are some times where the uh, the new moon is pretty equidistant to the vernal equinox, and so. Yeah. Oh, I, what I applaud uh, Yoel for doing is that he said, you know, it's not my job to determine which of these new moons are renewing. It's not new moon, but renewing first uh, sliver of light uh, starts the first of the year. It's my job to present the information and then you to think about it. Because mm-hmm. there's, you know, there's a every lot year to I think get about. two or three emails at least of people asking me how I, you know, when, when I'm going to be celebrating. And I don't usually don't give much of an answer beyond going, I look here. These are the resources yeah. that I'm using. You know, yes. this is your best. This chapter is your best source of information for that. Right. It's and I think that chapter actually does a nice job of walking people through the thought process without saying, mm-hmm. we're not going to tell you what day. We're going to tell you the thought process to use, and you should use it because there's a lot that, that goes into it that I don't think God wants us to miss. For example, why is it associated with barley? And why is the first month called a beep? Those are really significant concepts. Yeah. yeah. You know, barley. Yahweh uses agricultural metaphors, and his favorite happens to be the metaphors of the three things that uh, that uh, become symbols of uh, of saved souls and the process of of uh, culling. Uh, grinding out, uh, purifying that which is usable from that which is uh, dross and thrown away. One of those things happens to be barley as a grain. But barley is used to make bread. And bread can be leavened, which means it has yeast in it, and barley can be unleavened, which is matzah, but is used to make uh, bread. So barley, it has it's a perfect kind of an example because... Uh, uh, with all of those kinds of grains, there is the usable and nutritious uh, kernel, but there's also a lot of chaff. And so the chaff is the the vast preponderance of the of a grain crop is chaff, That's and it's dried up and blown away. It ceases to exist, which is the vast preponderance of people. You know, it's it's probably. One one thousandth or one ten thousandth or one one hundred thousandth. If you look at the whole plant from its roots to the uh, the stalk to the grassy part of it to the the kernel with the uh, the chaff uh, uh, the, the covering and the usable part of the kernel, I mean the whole thing is it's, you know it might be a one one hundred thousandth is that little kernel. So it's, a, it's a wonderful metaphor, and he uses of course uh, grapes. And olive, also olives, as the uh, as the metaphors that that everybody throughout time can understand. And then Abib speaks of green and growing. You know, if you're not receptive and green and growing and uh, and and the like, you're not going to get this message. If you've been surrounded by religion your whole life, and you are not flexible to the possibility that your religion is wrong, then if you're hard, dried up, it isn't going to matter. 
nothing Yahweh says is going to resonate. So that's why it is a bee, green and growing, receptive barley, the uh, the usable grain, speaking of saved souls. And so you you need to understand what a bee represents. And then the uh, um, Yahweh is about light, not darkness. So he is not going to establish a day um, for something important. For example, something like um, his means for eternal life, for perfection, which requires light, and being adopted in his family where we become light on anything other than the maximum light, which is a full moon. Mm-hmm. And so that's the reason why Pesach, Matzah, and Bakudim, and also why Shabua, uh not Shabuah, but, uh, but uh, Sukkah, occurred during a full moon, the 14th or 15th or 16th day of the new month where the light on the moon is beginning to renew. And and Kodesh, which speaks of the renewing light on the moon, that's also an important concept, and you ought not miss it in your study of this, of what Pesach represents, what Matzah represents, what Bakudam represents, because it speaks of renewal, the renewal of light. What happens when we become part of Yahweh's covenant family? We are renewed. We are restored. And so it's about growing light, not waning light. Waxing, not waning. Extremely important. So if you're just told the date, none of that's going to resonate with you. Yeah. And and I think, fellas, that the moment you begin to think, to believe, that all I have to do is to do this. You know, this is this is the instruction manual. I uh, I observe Passover, Matzah, and Bakudim, and I and I do what is asked. That that's going to make me right with Yahweh. No, it's not. That's not. What's going to make you right with Yahweh is is coming to understand what He is offering and asking, accepting and responding to it. You can't yeah. accept, understand, or respond. If you're simply acting out a set of uh, of rules, yeah. I was telling someone in the chat room just now that's uh, something we've been doing a lot around here. You know, as Delin's gotten older, is we've started doing the action stuff, yeah, you know, the specifics a lot more, but as a teaching tool. So we'll have her do it right. and then, while we're explaining to her why we're doing. It. That's why we chose to use the observational. We were able to go out with her, look for the moon one night, see it wasn't there, then show her where it was the next night. And so, you know, as we're explaining it to her, so that was my kind of view from using that this year. In the past, we used to actually yeah. use more of the astronomical, but with uh, yeah. having her, it makes a great teaching tool. Yeah, mm-hmm. It's not about doing but, it to do it, but it's a great way to explain and teach her. And, you know, I want you to tell me, what is more important than educating your daughter about something that will bring her closer to her Heavenly Father? Nothing. What could you do in your life that's better than that? Nothing again. Nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And when you were doing it, you were doing it for her. My guess is it made you feel really good. Oh, yeah. So you may have gotten more out of it than she did. At this age, probably. Yeah, probably. That's the way it's designed, by the way. That's the whole purpose behind it. So, you know, that's why I don't want to give anybody the date because I think knowing the date is... It's not irrelevant, but it's on the one to ten scale of importance. It's a one. Well, figuring it out and figuring out what you're going to do yourself is, you know, what's important because that's you developing your relationship, not just doing what someone else told you to do. Correct. Right. You know, you know investing um, that time um, to research it and look into it and decide, okay, I'm going to choose this because of this, this, and this. Yeah. You know, in uh, in two days, half the world is going to celebrate the dumbest, most offensive, <laughs> pagan holiday ever perpetrated on humankind. And they're going to do it uh, thinking they're uh, being religious, that they're doing something that pleases God. They're going to go to an Easter Sunday sunrise service. Completely I think today is probably the dumbest one. The idea that God can die. Oh, yeah, Good Friday. And it's good that God dies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how can you be so God died, and that's stupid. a good thing. How could you be so stupid? 
You know, they call it, uh, you know, Body Thursday. It was a Thursday. Thursday is irrelevant. So is Friday. So is Saturday. So is Sunday. The days of the week are irrelevant. It wasn't the Last Supper, you idiot. It was Passover. It's black and white. It's not hidden. And what happened on the Shabbat is the most important thing in the world. And there isn't a Christian on the planet that's ever conceived, ever considered matzah. Mm-mm. There's Are you one telling on the you're planet celebrating matzah? They, they, they ask you what it is. They don't even know what it is. I've had that several times. They're like, what's that? You know, it's one of the seven feasts of the Bible. There's seven? There's seven. Yeah, could you <laughs> you carry that book around. You go to church every week, and you don't know that. Yeah. Would you tell me what happens if you celebrate Pesach and you do not observe matzah? You'd be separated. Hell. Yeah, hell. That's what happens. Eternal hell is Pesach without matzah. That's really stupid. You know, think about Pesach. Why is Pesach about a lamb? Why is it about a lamb? What's the first letter in uh, the title... L for Almighty God. What's the first letter in the title Ab for our uh, Heavenly Father? What, what, what is that? What is that letter? I, I, I must be having a senior moment here. What is that Aleph. letter? Oh, an Aleph. How is the Aleph drawn? A ram's head. Ram's head. Uh, uh, it's uh, the first letter and, and of and the alphabet. Is, is, is a ram a male lamb? Yes, sir. Yes, it is. Okay. Okay. So the the title God in Hebrew L. Father, Ab. Both begin, they're both two letters long, they both begin with a ram's head, which is a male lamb. Mm -hmm. And Pesach is about a male lamb? Mm -hmm. Oh, is there a connection? Did I stumble on something here that is, uh, that the world has missed? Is is there a connection here? Uh, George, I think you've got it. I think you got something there. so, So who does the lamb represent? Yahweh is doing the work. Absolutely. Yahweh is using the lamb because he has chosen to be part of the flock. He's chosen to lead the flock. He's chosen to become one of us. That's why he's chosen the ram. And he's saying, I'm the one making that sacrifice. When Abraham, and we're studying the story of Abraham now, took Yishak up to Mount Moriah, Moriah, and uh, and Yishak said, Hey, Dad, where's the lamb? What did his dad say? It will be provided. Yahweh will provide. That's exactly what he said. So why is it that half the world's population doesn't pay any attention to that, that Yahweh is going to provide the lamb. Did Yahweh provide the lamb? Yes, sir. Yes, he did. What was on Mount, Mor- what was on Mount Moriah? Which means, by the way, to revere Yah. What was there? There's a lamb. Did, uh, uh, did, yeah, didn't we find a male lamb right there? Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, Trapped. why is it since exactly 40 years bell later, 2,000 years, on the same day, Pesach. Why is it the world can't figure out that Yosha was the lamb representing Pesach? Why can't the world figure out that he could eat Pesach dinner and celebrate Pesach with his disciples and become the Pesach lamb the next day because the day in Hebrew begins with sundown Mm -hmm. and continues until sunset the following day? How come they can't figure that out? How is it that they because don't understand? Because that's all part of that Old that Testament, he was and Paul said that we don't need that. I mean, that's all that Old Testament. Paul said so we don't need that well, no that, more. There's a fellow, let's see, there's a prophet that we've been uh, studying here recently. Uh, it, it really, um, it, it, a prophet with a really long scroll uh, predicted a lot of things that pertain to um, uh, to uh, future events. Um, what's that prophet's name? 
Uh, something uh, something <laughs> Yah would save. Oh, that was Yasha Yah, right? Mm-hmm. Yasha Yah, yeah. Isaiah. Um, what did Yah, what did Yahweh convey through Yasha Yah in the fifty three chap fifty third chapter of that book? How oh, it would happen? Yeah, didn't he, he say did. that that exactly. uh, the uh, that that the lamb would accept the sins of the world? Mm-hmm. Didn't he explain this whole mm-hmm. thing? Right. What is is half the world illiterate? Um, How in the world can you they don't say read that you're, that you're read worshiping it. a God whose words you not only ignore, but you reject? Can mm-hmm. you explain that to me? It's a choice. Well, he knows my heart. <laughs> you know, I had a uh, oh, person I was communicating with this uh, the other day that, that said that that uh, they were a fan of um, of this particular 1930s, 1920s, 1940s uh, writer. And uh, the uh, the uh, you know the the whole presentation of this particular writer is that God loves everybody, and the degree that God loves you is to the degree that you worship Him. Oh yeah. Did you look at worship? Ex- excuse me. Now, if He is the Passover Lamb, who is doing the work? Who is making the sacrifice? Who is lifting who up? Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Yeah. I mean, there is a zero possibility that Yahweh is going to choose Pesach as the means to eternal life and to serve as the Pesach lamb if his choice is for mankind to worship him and serve him. I, Seems to me like it's the other way around. Mm-hmm. And it makes sense the other way around because Yahweh, as the Passover lamb, can in fact make us immortal, can in fact lift us up. We, as the Passover lamb, are simply dead. We can't do nothing. We can die. <laughs> are the only thing Yahweh dead. asks of us is to leave our baggage at the door before entering his house, not to bring that That's religious that. rubbish in with us. Mm hmm. That's right. He does everything Except else. That's the only thing we have to do. Leave the garbage at the door. Leave the in fact. Leave the garbage even before you outside walk the door. The door. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I ain't coming to my house. I don't want to spend any time around. You have to be an absolute moron to be a Christian. I mean, you do. You have to be a moron to uh, to not be able to to put these pieces together. What it basically says is, I'm going to ignore everything God said because I know that what he said is completely incongruent with what I believe. And so the only way I can believe is to be ignorant and irrational. So that's what I'm going to do because my belief is far more important than anything else. So Pesach is about Yahweh as the Passover lamb. Because Yahweh can make the sacrifice necessary for us to become immortal. But becoming immortal and being imperfect is counterproductive. That's an express ticket to Sheol. Mm -hmm. So when you guys have your Pesach dinner tomorrow night, are you going to have a bunch of really leavened bread along with it? Not at all. Nope. No. Going to have some nice homemade matzah. Right. I started seven days of matzah this evening tell you that that uh, none of this is a sacrifice for me. I ain't, I ain't given squat here. I have lamb is my favorite meat, and I love it barbecue. Oh, yeah. And uh, I season it with uh, uh, such that it, I mean, it is really yummy, and I just love it. <laughs> and I eat matzah all year round. And my favorite way to eat matzah is to dip it in olive oil with, uh, with herbs. So, Pesach, it takes on special meaning, and I happen to love red wines. I, uh, I had a wine from Yisrael uh, uh, tonight with my son. Uh, so all of it for me is just, uh, okay, <laughs> this is really cool. Really I could do this I could do this forever and, uh, and not change an iota. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, we eat matzah on Pesach because the 
unleavening of our souls. Leaven is a, uh, it's not unleavening, the unyeasting of our souls. Yeast is the thing that is called out. Yeast is a fungus. It permeates. And therefore, yeah, I was saying, and it, by the way, it intoxicates. It's yeast that creates the intoxicating nature, both of beer and wine. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I was saying that I want to remove the intoxication, which is religion. It's politics. Those are the intoxicating things in, in our world. And I want to remove those from you and so that you're perfect. And then you can be adopted into my family. And so we begin matzah on yeasted bread while we're taking advantage of the doorway to life via Pesach. And, of course, where was the lamb's blood um, smeared? Was it smeared on the, door. On the floor? On the uh, floor on the house? On a post. No. Was it, was it upright, smeared on the roof of the, the house? Doorway. Was it, you know, no. God's in heaven. And so, if he, well, you wanted him to say, wouldn't you smear the blood on the roof? <laughs> Not if he's not if, right if you wanted everybody in the family to say, wouldn't you spread it on the walls of the house? No. Where did he ask for it to be spread? The lintel and, and the doorpost. Door right. Yeah, the, the frame of the doorway, right? Mm-hmm. Why? Because that's the way to, the doorway to eternal life. Eternal Understand life. that Pesach is a doorway. Doorway to what? To life. Life where? I mean, there's two ways to have eternal life. Yeah, Shamiin with Yahweh. Yeah. Seventh dimension. Doorway. It's the doorway to Yahweh's home. Pesach is the doorway to Yahweh's home. That's why it was just so amazing that when uh, Yahweh told Yasha Yah, or Yasha Yah, uh, walked through the doorway into Shamaim and into, into heaven, there he is in the spiritual realm. And it's the first time he's been there with Yahweh. And Yahweh took him to Shamaim, the spiritual realm, and he's now standing right before Yahweh. And uh, Yahweh becomes despondent. And uh, Yasha Yah, Isaiah, becomes despondent. He says, oh my God, what have I done? Here I've just begun my mission. You know, I'm, I'm just a few years into it. And uh, I'm grieving God, and you know I can understand that because, <laughs> listen, you know I, I, I'm one one billionth of what Yasha Yah is, uh, uh, as are you fellas, uh, and and yet we, we know that our lives don't measure up. You know we're we're delighted to be used in this way as uh, dented uh, and uh, and flawed implements, but you know you're you're brought in front of Yahweh and he's despondent, and you're going to say yeah you're you're. <laughs> You're right. I could have done, could have done a lot better. Mm-hmm. I'm really sorry. I should have done a lot better. Could have done a lot better. But that wasn't what Yahweh was despondent about. He's very clear, and he says it's about the doorway. I opened the doorway to my home, and no one was there. He opened the doorway at Pesach. He is the Pesach Lamb. He provided the means to his home. And he's saying that over the course of a couple of thousand years, no one took advantage of it. No one. That's why it's just so sad that people are religious, that they believe those buffoons that are that are you know, I I'm almost afraid to say misleading them. Because to be misled suggests that somehow the guidance isn't obvious, that somehow the path isn't clear, that somehow they had to be really devious to take them uh, in the opposite direction. And, you know, I was once there. I was once amongst those not only misled, but who was misleading. But once you see how obvious it is that that all of the, what they're presenting is just a bunch of mumbo jumbo lies, and it's just pathetic, and none of it, none of it makes any sense. It's all wrong, and that God's guidance is so clear. It's really hard to be sympathetic to those who are going in the wrong direction. It's so clear. It's so obvious. And so here we are selling Pesach. We're selling matzah along with it because both are essential and that they lead to the greatest of all things, 
being adopted into God's family, Bukurim, becoming firstborn children. And that is uh, what this day represents. It is Pesach Matzah Bukurim. I, um, I know it's celebrated over three days. It's actually celebrated over seven days, but it's three days celebrated over seven. Um, I don't think they're independent. Hmm. Yeah, That's they're one unit. They are one unit. And there's actually now, times, I, re- I believe, in the prophets where it's, they refer to it as you know, one holiday, basically. Yeah, yeah. Once a week. Right. Yeah. Yes. Now, I was reading in the chat room about uh, someone asking a question. You know, do you remove all chemical leavening agents from your home? Now, I'm going to I'm going to answer what I do. And uh, I'm, I've never claimed to be right. I'm just going to share my thinking on it. And, and you can, if you have a different thought, that's fine. I do not. Masa does not mean unleavened. It means unyeasted. It's unyeasted. There was no chemical leavening agents at the time. There was yeast. Yeast is a fungus. You cannot use uh, a chemical leavening agent. To make beer or wine, to ferment something to create alcohol. Uh, the, and, and and we're dealing with bread here. Almost no one uses a chemical leavening agent to aerate bread. Yeast is used to make bread. Yeast is used to make wine. Yeast is used to make beer. Yeast makes these intoxicated uh, beverages. Yeast is a fungus. God's not talking about a chemical leavening agent. Now, there are a lot of people that say, ah, you know, well, it's still called unleavened bread, and I don't want to take any chances. That's not my attitude on this. Now, I'm going to go back to King Shaul. King Shaul didn't negate part of the Torah. What did he do? What did he do that caused Yahweh to be so angry with him? He started adding to it. That's it. He had his own rules that he added to it. That's what the rabbis do. They have their own rules that they add to it. Isn't now, what removing? Did, yeah, what did Chawa do when speaking with the serpent? Yeah. He added, added to, to what it. Chawa said. Yahweh don't said, don't it. eat it. She added to it. Right. Don't touch it. It's... In, in my view, you can have a different view, and uh, and you could be right and I could be wrong. My view is, don't add to it. It's on yeast. The, the translation, I was guilty for a long time calling it un- unleavened. It's unyeasted bread. There was no leaven in the, uh, in the day. Yeah. Leavening agents, there was no leavening agent. It's yeast. And so I do not exclude uh, baking powder. Just don't. I just don't. I don't think it pertains. They might say, "Oh, well, you know, you're being way too lax about this whole thing." You're, you're like, you're God, man. No. First of all, I do. I really think that God cares if uh, I have a piece of sourdough uh, toast tomorrow morning for breakfast. <laughs> I really, I, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to because I happen to like the symbolism of, of these days, mm-hmm. and I'm not going to. I, but do, do you think that? Our relationship's going to be over because uh, I decided, you know, tomorrow morning, God, a little sourdough toast with a uh, little uh, uh, butter on it. Boy, that really, really? sounds yummy. No. I no, really like sourdough. I don't think there's any danger yeah. there. I, yeah, I, I I've had a few so. times where during um, matzah, you know, I get to work. I haven't had my coffee. I'm kind of half dragon. I go into the teacher's lounge to do something, and they have a box of donuts. So I'm like, ooh, I'm going to stake a donut. And I get halfway yeah. through it and go, oh, no, go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't think God. Way, I don't subscribe to the idea of God sitting up there just looking for me to make a mistake to kick me out. No. And you know the the beauty of the whole thing is that almost all of his instructions are in the imperfect anyway. So if you set the donut mm-hmm. down, even if the donut was an issue, it's no longer an issue the moment you set it down. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it's a marvelous uh, part of the whole thing. Now we have been studying. Yeah, I was discussions with Abraham because they established the terms and conditions of the covenant and the benefits of the covenant. It's the only place that the terms and conditions of the covenant are delineated so matter-of-factly. 
so clearly, so comprehensively. Uh, within con- within the context of that relationship, where Yahweh is, is saying over and over again, this is my covenant relationship. Over and over again. And I view, I've come to view, Pesach, Matzah, Bakodim, Shabua, and uh, and really even Teruah, Kippurim, and Sukkah as all a celebration of the covenant. I don't think they exist apart from the covenant. I don't think they have any purpose apart from the covenant. I don't think the covenant uh, exists without them, these seven Moed Mikre. And I don't think the seven Moed Mikre exists without the covenant. I think they're, they are essentially one and the same. I think they're integrated and they exist for each other. So when we talk about the covenant, I think we're talking about the Mikra. When we talk about the Mikra, I think we're talking about the covenant. I, I see no distinction between them. You know, you, the whole purpose of the covenant is to is to leave the family of man, come to know Yahweh, come to benefit from what Yahweh is offering, walking to Him, becoming perfect coming to trust and rely on him and observing the terms of the the covenant relationship and circumcising yourself from the rest of the world to become part of his family. That's the entire purpose of the covenant. The entire purpose of the Moed Mikre is to walk through the door of Yahweh's home for eternal life, for Yahweh to perfect us so that he can adopt us into his family and as fathers are wont to do, he can enrich and empower us on Shabuwa so that we can do the business of the Father, which is to share this message and invite others to participate and also provide a warning to the world on Teruah so that we all can be reconciled into God's family and on Sukkah camp out with him for all eternity. How are those stories any different? Is there even a nuance of difference between those stories? No. I don't think so. So I think that if you don't understand the covenant, you have no chance of understanding the Mikra. If you don't understand the Mikra, you have no chance of understanding the covenant. If you don't celebrate the Mikra, you can't be part of the covenant. If you're not part of the covenant, you can't celebrate the Mikra. The Moed Mikra, Pesach, Matzah, Bakodim, Shabuah, Teruah, Kippurim, and Sukkah do a person zero good if they're not part of the covenant. If they're part of the covenant, they can't benefit from the covenant unless they celebrate those seven days. They they are coterminous. They're synonymous. You can't talk about the covenant without talking about the Moed Mikre. You can't talk about the Moed Mikre without understanding the covenant. It's all about Yahweh providing the means for us to become part of his family, to live with him forever, to disassociate from the corruption of man and to become part of his spiritual world. That's why it's just so unbelievably stunning that so many people have been led to believe that there was this fellow named Jesus Christ not Yosha, who celebrated a Last Supper, not Passover. That God himself died when the eyewitness testimony clearly says just the opposite, that the Spirit hey, left, him left him before he took his last breath. Him. Right. So it's just the Passover lamb, the body of the Passover lamb was all that was left, and the soul went into Sheol to serve as the perfecting, unyeasting aspect of matzah, and that it is so obvious. Every nuance of the eyewitness accounts, plus all the testimony that Yahweh has provided through his prophets, clearly say that on Bakurim, that was a spiritual rebirth, that the, that the soul and the spirit were reunited and that a physical body became irrelevant. There was... The physical body that became the Pesach lamb was long gone. It was destroyed on the night of Pesach. 
didn't exist anymore. There was no bodily resurrection. It would be counterproductive. And yet that 3.5 billion people believe that God actually died and that he was bodily resurrected on an Easter Sunday. Having no concept of Pesach, Matzah, Bakurim. Having no concept of the name that he lived. Having no concept of what the Pesach lamb represents, who it is. Having no concept that all of this was done for the one and only original covenant that was established through Abraham. Why do you suppose they left it in the creed that he went into what hell? Part? Well, the Nicene Creed says he died and then he, he uh, his soul went into hell. Yeah. And nobody ever asked that question? I did, yeah, but no one ever, nobody the, ever gave an answer. It, it's true. I mean, his soul went into hell. So obviously shield. they just ignored what, what? more than... Right, right. Somebody should have said, well, wait a minute, time out, why did we do this? Why, do, why did he do that? Yeah. I mean, it's obvious the prophets tell us. Yeah. Psalm 22, Psalm 88 are explicit. Isaiah 53 is explicit. Mm-hmm. It's not he has hidden. to. He has to. Right. Someone has to pay that price, too. It's not just death. Right. It's uh, death of the... Exactly. Know, like, what, what do you think that in Second uh, Samuel uh, 7, what do you think he's talking about when he says, I'm not going to... When sin is associated with him, I'm not going to spare the uh, the discipline. Mm-hmm. What do you think he's talking about? Mm-hmm. It wasn't God beating the crap out of him on uh, on Pesach. It was the Romans. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then and then the idiot Christians, particularly the Catholics, think that the Jews are the Jesus killers. How could you be so stupid? Crucifixion was a Roman, Roman form of Church. execution, and that Imperial Rome and the Roman Catholic Church are coterminous. You did it. Roman Catholics, you did it. Live up to it. Own it. You were ignorant then, you're ignorant now. Oh, it's The whole thing is just so amazing to me. And of course, no one seems to understand what is the correlation between wine and blood if it isn't the blood of the Pesach lamb being smeared on the doorway to life as part of Pesach. How hard is that connection to make? Why do they have wine at communion and they can't make the connection? Why do they have the little flat wafers of bread and they can't make the connection to matzah? I mean, what is it with people? How can they be so stupid? I mean, you have to be a moron to be religious. It's just the f- fact that, okay, we're going we're gonna to have an Easter bunny laying eggs. Do bunnies lay eggs? <laughs> Not that I'm aware of. None that I know of. Where, Maybe the what is the correlation between God and a bunny? Where does God Nothing. speak of bunny? Nothing. Nothing. Oh. Where does God speak of eggs? Wait, isn't the bunny re- actually spoken of as one of the animals not to eat? <laughs> yes. Could you also tell me where, when Yahweh is speaking of uh, of Estarte as the queen of heaven and the mother of God, and he's condemning her, what was her most common name prior to the creation of Roman Catholicism? Eve. What was Estarte's most popular name prior to the formation of Roman Catholicism. It was it was an Eve. Ish, Ishtar. 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 Yeah. What is Ishtar? Easter. Mm-hmm. The Roman Church named the pagan holiday after the pagan goddess, the God. Queen of Heaven and the Mother of God. Going all the way back to Babylon. And part of the Roman religion, part of the Greek religion, part of the Egyptian religion. They didn't even change the name. And still you got an Easter Sunday celebrating Ishtar, the the whore of Babylon, the incarnation of Satan himself, with a bunny that lays eggs. 
Oh, it's also harmless. No, it isn't. It's putrid. It's revolting. It's disgusting. It's an abomination. Everyone who's going to celebrate Easter is separating themselves eternally from God. And deservedly so. Hey, Kirk, you did a little mm-hmm. bit of research. Yes, sir. How hard was it to find that there is no justification in Yahweh's testimony whatsoever for Easter, and there's wholesale condemnations of it, and that Easter is a Babylonian pagan mm-hmm. holiday? How hard was that to figure out? Oh, I've known it for years. There's, there's thousands of books on it. Plus, you can on the internet now. You can 15 minutes now. I, I knew that before I had any uh, idea who Yahweh was. Yeah. Right. I knew that as a Christian. I just thought everybody had gone nuts. Yes, you're just nuts. And and Christmas. You know, how many months uh, is uh, is it from uh, Easter Sunday to uh, Christmas Day? About nine. Nine. And. Uh, what is the gestation period of a human? Nine. Nine months. Oh. So isn't the pagan story that the sun, which was God, impregnated Mother Earth and also the Queen of Heaven, Mother of God, on the Sunday closest to the vernal equinox, Easter Sunday, so that nine months later the Mother of God and the Queen of Heaven could deliver as the Madonna and Child the Son of God? Isn't that central to every pagan religion? Absolutely. So why in the hell how you, how you sell it? do Christians celebrate these these pagan abominations? When when Yahweh spoke of the uh, of the seventh day, and that's the day you should keep set apart. Mm-hmm. Is the seventh day the first day of the week? No. No. Is the always, seventh day ever the first day of the Saturday. week? Yeah. yeah. Is the first day ever the seventh day of the week? Ever? Never. No. What day of the week is Sunday? It's the first day of the week. Yep. According to Paul, that's when you can gather all your, well, you're supposed to bring all your stuff to the warehouse. His particular warehouse. No. Well, the way they sell it. Is. Yeah. yeah. It's, it is absolutely pathetic. If you're a Christian, you're celebrating on Easter Sunday, you're celebrating Christmas, you are an idiot. You deserve to have your soul cease to exist. Good riddance. Don't want to see you in heaven. You're not coming to heaven. And if you're one of those promoting it, enjoy your fellow Christians in hell. Because that's where you're headed. And you deserve it. This is not hard. And yet, it's amazing that if you were to share this with any religious person, none of them will accept it. None of them will process it. You're the bad guy. I I want to cling to my... Believe I'm going to continue to believe the Roman Catholic Church. What a stupid fool. It's just disgusting. You're disgusting. If you're a Christian celebrating Easter. And, and just think about a Sunday worship service. Now, we've talked about... Sunrise that service. Yeah. Well, yeah, sunrise service. Now we're back to the sun god. Uh, and Sunday, of course, is the day to honor the sun uh, because mm-hmm. that's what all pagans do. Uh, and, of course, mm-hmm. you know, they're, uh, the pagan uh, and Christian gods all have halos, which is a symbol of the sun, and there's sunbursts throughout the religious uh, symbols. And, of course, Easter, Sunday, and uh, Christmas are sun holidays. It's called the, the vernal equinox and the uh, winter solstice. Mm-hmm. All pagan, all sun-related. Uh, um, you haven't gone beyond the pagan religions of uh, of yesteryear. But, you know, as I drive by buildings and they're going to have Sunday worship services, if you've got half a brain, how hard is it to realize that a God that would create a being to worship him isn't worth knowing? Not only isn't he worth worshiping, he isn't even worth knowing. I mean, that's just a revolting, demeaning concept that God would create an inferior being to worship him. And that makes man at the level, or makes God at the level of perverted man. Yeah, men mm-hmm. like to be worshipped. Yeah. But that's basically what's happening there. It's taking, uh, making God in the image of the most perverted and twisted men. 
to think that he wants to be worshipped. You know, we've talked about this before, and yet it continues to go on. Uh, JB, you're a pretty fit guy. Yeah, how are you going to be? Uh, how are you at lifting God up? <laughs> uh, not very good. No. My daughter's and, getting and to the point just, where I struggle to Let's just say that you could up. elevate him a uh, a, uh, a a millimeter. quarter of an inch. Yeah. See, see if you could do that. What good would it do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No good. No. And uh, can you will you lift you up, JB? Oh yeah, easily. Would he enjoy doing so? Oh yeah. Yep. As he promised about to do like something. I do when I pick my daughter up. Right. It's a good thing, right? They just mm-hmm. have it backwards. Everything is backwards. This is one of the few years, though, by the way, that Pesach, what Yahweh has, uh, is offering us as the doorway to life, and matzah, the means to uh, perfection, to remove the the fungus of religion and politics from our souls, so that we are. Uh, acceptable to Yahweh and therefore can be adopted into his family. Uh, this is one of the few times where they're uh, they're going to overlap. In fact, if you're like me and you're celebrating this year Pesach on uh, uh, tonight, guess what? Bukurim and Easter Sunday overlap. Doesn't happen very often. Hmm. That doesn't happen very often. Uh, the truth is uh, is being covered up by the religious lie. That's why God hates religion so much. If religion had taken its own course and it just said, okay, you know, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, to present salamanders and uh, and uh, and um, chameleons as uh, as divine representatives and you're going to uh, come to uh, to celebrate your relationship with them by uh, bubbling up slime, and uh, you're going to do so on uh, you know a schedule that has absolutely nothing to do with God. Yeah. Okay. Propose your plan. See how many people you can fool. You know, be like Scientology, and you know, have. Uh, <laughs> The uh, uh, extraterrestrials in the volcano and sucking in souls. I, go ahead and see how many people you can snooker that way. But don't play off the truth. Don't cover up the truth. Don't do what Mormons do. Don't do what Roman Catholics do. Don't do what Protestant Christians do. Don't even do what rabbinical Jews do. And pile your lies on top of the on truth so as truth. to hide the truth with your lies because that's the thing that really upsets God nothing bothers Yahweh more so those are my thoughts on uh, on Pesach do you guys have any more before uh, we return to the story of the of the covenant no I think that kind of covers it yeah I did one thing this week though that you we might do sometime in the near future yeah. or whatever I I took the um I was I was studying the seventeen nine that where we'd left where we were supposed to uh, begin. We had covered off before that. And you wrote my family covenant relationship continually examine, uh, carefully consider, genuinely consider. And then in the second paragraph, uh, the start of seventeen ten, it says the same thing uh, again. And I started going through all the different words that were related to to observe, mm-hmm. and then, uh, so I went through that, and that's kind of fun, but uh, I, then I took another piece of paper, and I said, okay, let's take a look at uh, Shemar Torah, which was what we were asked to do, and I was doing it in the in verses, keep my commandments, mm-hmm. and I looked all these things up in, in the lexicons, but I also looked them all up in the English dictionaries, mm-hmm. and uh, it was amazing. Um, how they've twisted it. It's amazing how, uh, and, and even in the dictionaries, if you were to read the dictionaries, like I have a, a large, uh, Terry has his large Weber's, uh, Webster's um, Encyclopedia Dictionary. And if you read everything it says, they have to fight real hard to get keep in there uh, <clears throat> as a meaning. And, and they, they give you 
tons of room, leeway, to come back to Shamar, which is to observe. It just went on and on and on and on. It's, uh, so I thought, you know, you, you just have to lie to do this. I mean, yeah. I can I can prove it to you, but, I mean, I, it's just amazingly, um, you know, even using keep as a translation for Shamar, it's, it's said 219 times, and 200 times they change it to law, and it just yeah. isn't there. It just ain't there. Um, no, it it's a secondary thing, and, and then you go to keep, and keep is <laughs> is mostly about observing. Yeah, I have no idea how they get keep out of uh, Shamar. And well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple just for food for thought, just in case you think, uh-huh. uh, if sure. everybody out there is thinking that they need to keep these keep. rules uh, and do them specifically. I mean, we're going to do as many as we can correctly just yeah. because. Yeah, and by the way, they mean keep. They, they use keep as to obey. They look yes. use keep as synonymous with obey. Mm-hmm. And, and it has to be keep. With in conjunction with keeping my commandments to reinforce right. it, because if you look up keep keep the Anglo-Saxon word is is they say keep, observe, and regard uh, to watch over. <laughs> and by the way, <laughs> uh, uh, keep, keep has observe uh, and watch over and regard. That is a uh, a valid definition of of shamar. You know, is yeah, to keep yeah. your eyes open, oh, yeah. to keep yeah. focus. To, uh, to keep, to watch. keep observing, regard, regard you know, the information highly, right. regard the right. highly. Right, yes, yes. To, to pay attention. To decor, keep right. it alive. So the original care. definition of keep was just fine. It's just that that's not what keep means now when people read it in their English Bibles. And just to use the word keep, because that's not what people read, mm-hmm. is a hugely yeah. misleading uh, concept because the shamar, the best, the best single word to translate mm-hmm. shamar is to observe. And if you were well, to choose a, a series of words, because sometimes people look, I'm Torah observant, they will think, well, you're Torah obedient. No. Mm-hmm. To observe no. is to closely examine and carefully consider. That's what mm-hmm. observe means. But here, here's some more fodder for you, if you like. Uh, is mm-hmm. to remain in, in a position or a state, to con- it means to continue. It means to keep at it, to persevere. Uh, mm-hmm. That's Sarah. You know, that's good. Right. That's uh, right. To remain in one's... Yeah. Uh, sorry? Yeah, that's uh, right. To Sarah remain in one's... To, yeah, to endure and to persevere, to keep at yes. it. You yeah. know, yeah. and even, and I, I kind of like this, you know, Sarah also means to wrestle with, to struggle yeah. with. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm-hmm. There are times when I've struggled with Yahweh. Sure. I don't know about you guys, but there's times I've struggled with them. There are, oh, yeah. there are times when I say, you know, I don't get that. I don't know why you use this term. I don't know why you made it uh, this way. Um, you know, it's it's not what I would have chosen, um, and and I will struggle with it. And he didn't have a problem with that, by the way. Well, I had I had that experience uh, last night um, before I got to this part, and uh, I'll share that with you in a second if you want. But yeah, back to keep is is to remain in one's power and or possession. These are some of the negative things, uh, not to lose or to part with. Which ain't bad to preserve, right. persevere. I mean to preserve. It also means a course of action, to continue, to maintain, and to keep uh, to keep in step, to walk, walk in the path of the Moed Mikris. Wow. So if I was just looking at keep, I said, you know, I might have a hard time twisting that around to the way they're using it, until right. I get to the next word, which of course is command. Right. And that's an order given by an authority. It's a Latin word. It's not an Anglo-Saxon word. And it comes from the French through the Latin. And it means to commit to an order uh, with authority, to lay an injunction, to exercise supreme authority, especially military, to have control over, to compel, to exercise influence and power over others. It's a mandate. It is a control factor. Mm-hmm. Now, when you put keep with that, Nobody misses the point that they want to give you. Whereas yeah, it's so amazing to me, Kirk, that uh, that in this regard, that that most people have been throughout time, it's not just mm-hmm. today, but throughout time, have been led to believe that their military provides their freedom and that their military is providing a service when nothing could be further from the truth. No, the military is the is the, is the antithesis of uh, of a source of freedom. It is the antithesis of a service. In fact. 
in the military, it's a command and control regimen where there is no freedom. It is the least free institution uh, in any society. Uh, so it's the militarism and patriotism around militarism is uh, is as big a lie and a big part of the problem for people in their inability to distance themselves from the family of man and to choose the family of God, the covenant, as is religion. I, I, I think they are equally sinister, equally wrong, mm-hmm. equally uh, deliberate, uh, uh, debilitating. Uh, I think that, uh, Kirk, that which I think your point is here, mm-hmm. that the two words that Yahweh uses the most to instruct us what is in our interest, yes. uh, they are Shama and Shamar. Mm-hmm. One is to use your eyes to observe, which is mm-hmm. to closely examine, and the other is to use your ears to listen. There isn't a single time that Yahweh says, use your mouth to blabber. <laughs> There's not a single time he says, you know, get on your knees and pray. Yeah. Not once. And yet it's and hundreds, of, you hundreds of times that he uses Shamar, Observe, closely examine, use your eyes to see what I have conveyed, use your ears to listen to what I have to say, and never once tells us to open our mouths and blabber to him. Like you said it before, you know, God gave us two eyes, two ears, and one mouth. Take a clue. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've, uh, I, I wasn't blessed with. I, I think I was blessed with a, with a decent mind. You know, I, I think I, you know, I'm not in, in, in Dode's category by by any stretch. But you know, I'm, I'm, you know, my noggin is is probably works at a slightly faster pace than the average noggin. Um, mm-hmm. And you know, I'm, I think that uh, you know, by using my noggin and examining, yeah, I was testifying. I figured out some things that are really, uh, really profound, really interesting. But I'm here to tell you. That, that when it comes to uh, a dialogue with Yahweh, I'm a lot better off listening to him than I am talking to him. <laughs> there say there we isn't all. a single thing that I can tell him that he doesn't know. And there are is an infinite number of things he can tell me that I don't know. There is nothing I can tell Yahweh that he will benefit from. There's a, innumerable things that Yahweh can tell me that I will benefit from. If I listen to him, we both benefit. If he listens to me, neither of us benefit. I mean, it's not hard. You know, I, I've studied this now for more than 15 years. Uh, I've, uh, amongst the family, I'll, I'll share and talk. But it's between you and me, I'm all about listening. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Not about talking. You know, I've, not like the Pope, I'm not going to go pray about it. I'm not going to ask anybody else to pray about it. I'm not going to pray about it. I'm going to listen. Mm-hmm. Where, and what are you going to listen to? You're going to listen to the Torah. I want to listen to the Torah. The nobody else I want to listen to you. I was teaching. Right. No. Yeah, somebody asked me the other day, well, what you know, what authors do you uh, like? Well, there's only one that I like. I like Yahweh. I like Yahweh. I like Yahweh. Yeah, that's good enough for me. Moshe. Yeah, yeah, you know, people say, you know, uh, you know Moshe, uh, Moses had a lot to say. Do you, you like him? Yeah, um, um, it's true that Moshe did have a lot to say. The body aim is Moshe uh, summarizing and, and uh, trying to explain what Yahweh said. But other than that, Moshe is a conduit. You know, if... Yeah, he's a if you really author. want to boil down all the books that I've written, I'm, I'm nothing but a conduit. I mean, it's, this is what Yahweh said. Let's translate what he said, and then let's try to understand what he said. Hey, you're just a conduit. Well, now, that's not to demean Moshe. Being a conduit on behalf of Yahweh, that's, that's a cool job, man. <laughs> that's a cool job. Well, the benefits are, are forever. But still, that's that's what it's all about. So, with that all said, uh, we uh, we have about 20 minutes uh, or so left. Uh, let's just uh, revisit Barashith 17.7, and then we'll move on from there. 
Uh, I think I heard here. someone uh, email about this earlier this week. They were wondering what exact what chapter are we in in observations, and I couldn't remember off the top of my head. So I told them I'd have. Ten. Uh, Okay, ten. 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 I told him I'd make ten. sure I'd have you tell everyone before we got ten. into it this week. So yeah, we're in uh, we're in Kirk's favorite uh, chapter of the book. <laughs> Is that fair to say, Kirk? Yes, indeed. Yeah, my favorite, my favorite too. In fact, I would say ten is my favorite chapter of all of the books. Mm-hmm. You take all the books collectively. Ten is my favorite chapter of all the books. I think if you were just wow. to read one thing, I just read chapter ten of uh, of observations for our time, and uh, that's where essentially everything you need to know is presented right there. Uh, so it's mm-hmm. my favorite chapter of all of the books. We're on page. Uh, 79 of 100 of Chapter 10. And by the way, Chapter 11 is also uh, uh, really, really, really uh, good with me. But, but Chapter 11 is uh, is not all that strong without Chapter 10. You don't need anything to appreciate 10. You need 10 to appreciate 11. 11 is the test. You know, it's an open book test, but you're tested on your understanding, commitment to the covenant. And by the way, I'm really glad that Yahweh has a test. And the reason I'm really glad is, you know, we went through a period of time where we had uh, uh, two groups of people that uh, really went south. I mean, they went way wacko conspiracy theory. And uh, uh, but they could parrot, oh, I'm covenant. They could parrot Yahweh's name. They could uh, they could say Pesach and Matzah. They could use the vocabulary. They didn't have any understanding of it. If Yahweh didn't have a test and all you had to do is parrot this stuff, uh, then uh, eternal life would be corrupted with a lot of really whacked out people. So I'm actually very glad there's a test. The test is open book. Abraham passed the test. He was not the sharpest tool in the shed. Uh, So long as we seek to understand these things as opposed to simply parrot them, we will all pass the test. So, eleven is about the test. So, it is a uh, it's a really uh, fun chapter as well. All right. So, here is uh, Bob Rashid in the beginning, Genesis seventeen seven. We we covered this briefly at the end of uh, our program uh, last week. And I uh, okay. Who is the speaker here? Kirk, you know you know who's talking. Yeah, I'm gonna take a stand. Establish this. Uh... Yeah, who's that? Who's who's speaking here? Who's yeah. I? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he happens to be? Uh, the God of the universe, the creator. Yeah, the yeah, one and only God, yeah, creator, creator of the universe. Yeah, that, 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 that's the guy. The one we should really pay attention to. You know, if you're going to choose to listen to somebody, and your that's choice cool. is the pope, a minister, the president, you know, a general. Or a bit of ground tape. Yeah, the take judge. This, take this. Yeah. Or, or me. Now, uh, Don't listen to me. Listen yeah, to or, him. Or, or, or you and me. <laughs> Who do you think is more credible? I think Yahweh's got your hands down. Yeah, I'm going to go with the, I'm going to go with this guy, Yahweh. And I, I, not Jesus, not Muhammad, not Allah, not the President of the United States, not a military, and I. Personally, this is Yahweh speaking, I will take a stand to establish, confirm, and raise, therefore, my covenant family. Well, just right there, riveting. Mm-hmm. You know, stop the presses. It's Yahweh, the God that that uh, Christians want to relegate to the Old Testament because he no longer matters. They don't like him anymore. They want it to be their Jebus except they don't pay any attention to what Jebus actually said, or actually did. I will take a stand. Yeah, did uh, did Jebus exist at this point? No. No. This is Jebus. I will take the stand to establish, confirm, and raise. Oh, did he say the Old Covenant? Is there a word? Am I missing the old here? Singular my. Oh, you know, Paul called it the enslaving covenant because it was with Hagar. Is Yahweh saying this is a covenant with Hagar? No. Did he say this is the first covenant and there's going to be another one? 
did he say? The first of two covenants? Nope. What did he say? He said, my one and only, actually. Wow. Yes, yeah, one come. and only. Oh, but Singular. Like, my, Annie. Annie is, uh, is uh, I know, JB, one of your favorite uh, terms. A-N-Y means uh, I or my. It's first person. <clears throat> the uh, Pauline Christians would tell you that the old covenant was with the Jews. It was the Jewish thing. And God's really mad at them. So that's why he replaced it with the New Testament and the New Covenant. Um, whose is this covenant? Yahweh's. Yeah, it's, he's speaking in first person. He's calling it my family, my covenant. So do you think, how do you justify that being the Jewish covenant? If Yahweh was speaking in first person, by the way, at the time that Yahweh was calling no it my Jews covenant, were, were, there any, were there any Jews at the time that Yahweh was calling it my covenant? Not at all. Not one. Nope. Not, not one on the planet. That would be was descendants it? of Yahuda. Well, Yahuda uh, was a son of Yisrael, who was a son of Jacob, Yishak. who was a son of <laughs> Abraham. So we're you were a son of well, Yishak, five generations. Son of Abraham. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, sorry, folks. Five generations away here. Yeah, there are sorry, no folks. Jews at this point. That is correct. Not even close. Wake up. And I will take a stand to establish, confirm, and raise. Therefore, my covenant family. Now, okay, so that means Christianity with its new covenant is toast. It's gone. Can't exist. No room for it. That means there can be no Quran and Islam. It's all over. That means that God cannot be the Lord and cannot be worshipped because he is establishing a family. There are no lords, and there's no worshiping in a, in a family. All of it goes away. Religion, worship, the concept of the Lord being God, Christianity and Islam are all destroyed just with wa kum et bereth. All done. If you're aware of what God said, and you're a rational person... Christianity, Islam, Judaism, the concept of, the, of God being a Lord and of worship, of religion, are completely done away. Just with that simple statement. Now, God goes a little further, though. And I will take a stand to establish and confirm, therefore, my covenant family for the purpose of understanding by making connections between me and you to promote an association with your offspring after you, for their generations to approach by way of an everlasting family covenant relationship, to approach and exist as your God, and also for your offspring to approach after you. I have said this many times, and I'm going to re say it again right now. Uh, and my top ten Hebrew words is bien. B-Y-N. It's used twice here in this sentence. In fact, it's used twice just at this point in the sentence. What is the uh, primary definition of, of uh, bien? The, the root of bien. Well, as a verb, it means to understand. That is correct. As a verb, it means to understand. This is one of the few words that <clears throat> whose root is actually a, uh, a preposition. B-Y-N means between. To connect things. Mm -hmm. So, bien, as a, as a verb, means the process of understanding that is developed through making connections. So, without uh, Shamar, you can't do that. You have well, to approach without it Shamar, always. you don't know where the yeah. dots are. That's right. Okay? You without bien, you're not connecting them. Mm -hmm. It's... It's essential if you're going to understand who Yahweh is and what he is offering and asking in return and how you ought to respond to capitalize on what he is proposing. You have to understand, and the only way to understand is first to know through observation and then to make the connections 
through BN. This is the process that defines the path to be part of the covenant. BN is the path to the covenant. And God's not saying, I want you to understand the uh, the molecular weight of, uh, of navel <laughs> You know, he's not saying that I want you to understand how to cure cancer. No. What he's saying is, I want you to understand the connections between me and you, so as to promote an association between me and you. That's what he wants us to understand. Well, how do you make those connections? Well, I'm here to tell you, the single biggest connection you can make is the connection between the covenant and the invitations to meet with God, the Mikre. Understand that connection. Understand why Yahweh chose the ram's head for his two favorite titles, God and Father. Understand the connection between the ram's head and Pesach, the doorway to his home. Understand that and the connection between what happened on Mount Moriah with Abraham and then what happened 40 years Bell later with Yosha on that same mountain, also on Pesach. It's by making those connections that you understand, and it's only when you understand these connections between God and us and why God is doing it. You know, it's one thing to understand what, that Passover is the doorway to life. It's another thing to understand that the doorway to life connects God to us and us to God. That's the connection you need to make to capitalize on it. There's so many people that think that, uh, that salvation is a result either of a profession of faith or of being good, that you're going to go to heaven because you're a good person. I've done more good in my life than bad. No. Now, you know, people would say, you know, uh, you, know you can believe uh, in uh Passover, I'm going to believe in, uh, in Easter. It doesn't matter what I believe. It doesn't matter what you believe. All that matters is what's right and what's wrong. But you can't know what's right and wrong if you are not observant and thoughtful making these connections. That is how you go about right and wrong. And, and, and being correct with God and therefore part of his family or estranged from him. And you can't differentiate between right and wrong, good and bad, life and death, man or Yahweh, without going through this very process. And that's what God is saying here. You want to know the path to God's family? You want to know the path to heaven? That path is paved with understanding. Every stepping stone along that path is comprised of understanding. You get right down to it. Pesach is not about doing not what you do and when you do it or how you do it. It's do you understand the connection between Pesach and Yahweh. Be seeing that doorway, his home and us. That is what's being conveyed here. <clears throat> there is more insight and understanding in these statements than every Christian in the history of the world and every Christian scholar collectively has ascertained. You know, when somebody uh, this week asked me you know, what I thought about this particular author and everything I read about him, he said, no, if you could only love enough, you'd be the most powerful person in the world. Nonsense. <coughs> you know, people project on God what they want God to be, it's, but there's no correlation between who God actually is and what he said and what they write. None. What God says of himself and what he is offering is crystal clear. But the truth is in the words. And if you don't take the time to examine the words, you will not know the truth. And if you don't know the truth, if you don't have quality information, then it doesn't matter how well you connect the dots. You aren't going to understand. You could know everything that's known to Christians and connect all of it together, and you're still nowhere. You're estranged from God. Mm Mm-hmm. The, the things that you need to make the connections are in Yahweh's testimony. Understand what he said. Understand the words that he used. Understand the concept that he's conveying and the context that he's conveying it. That's what matters. 
So I will take a stand to establish and confirm, therefore, my covenant family for the purpose of understanding by making connections between me and you and to promote an association with your offspring. Now, this wasn't done for just Abraham. It wasn't done just for Sarah. It wasn't done just for Yishak. It wasn't done just for Jacob. It wasn't done just for the Jacob's 12 uh, children, 13 really, when you count the Loi. Mm-hmm. It wasn't done just for Yaudam and Yisrael. The for offspring everyone. of the covenant is all of us. All of us who come to God over the pathway of understanding. And that's the only way to approach Him. And understanding takes work. You know, it's not something that you're going to find. And you never stop. No, no, it's correct. It takes work. The most fun work you could possibly do, the most rewarding work you could possibly do, but it never stops. It's a a life change. Yeah. Your offspring after you. Now, I'm here to tell you, there is only one reason that this testimony and this discussion between Yahweh and Abraham is recorded for us, because it didn't do Abraham any good. I didn't even do Yishak any good because it wasn't available to Yishak. Mm-hmm. It didn't do Yaakov any good. It wasn't available to Yaakov. What, this testimony wasn't available in, for another 500 years. So, who's the testimony for? Everybody else. For your can read offspring it. after oh. you, for their generations to approach? How about, yeah, for everybody that came after him? Mm-hmm. For us. That's why this Everyone testimony. with eyes to read. Correct. Everyone with eyes to read and ears to hear. By way of a family that's going to exist until Paul comes along and changes everything. <laughs> until Jebus... Until Muhammad. This was a great plan for a while. For a while. But, uh, you know, it's, uh, it says Olam. Is there any definition of Olam other than forever? Ever? Everlasting? Nope. Into no. et- uh, eternity? Perpetual? So how could you have nope. an old covenant be replaced with a new covenant if the one and only covenant is everlasting? Is eternal. Correct. So where is the room for Christianity? There isn't. So when the two eyewitnesses, Yahu Kanan and Matanya, say that they heard Yosha say this is the uh, blood to establish the covenant, and then Lucas, who's the Roman who is uh, uh, Paul's uh, publicist and attaché, says, this is the new covenant. He wasn't do we have there, absolute, Do we have absolute, and he wasn't there. He's, uh, he's uh, it's hearsay. Uh, hearsay testimony. Uh, who is telling the truth? They, they're in conflict. They can't both be right. I'm going to go with the two guys that were there, that their statement actually confirms what Yahweh said. Yeah. yeah. And that's the bottom line. Yes, the two guys that were actually there, their testimony confirms what Yahweh said. And the two that were there, their testimony is credible and would be admissible in a court. And the one who wasn't there and is reporting hearsay is uh, is not credible, and he was not there, and he's the uh, the lone man out. But really, what matters? The only thing that matters is, is the testimony. What Yahweh said. So that's it. Yeah, if, by chance, Bandinya and Yao Kanan got it wrong, and uh, Lucas got it right. If he said, this I'm going to go with the one that's consistent. Said, the only one that matters is the one that's consistent with Yahweh. That all, that's all that matters. It can't be the renewed covenant because God said this covenant is eternal. And they might say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. In, in, in Jeremiah 31, he talks about the new <laughs> covenant. And it's different than the previous one. Oh, come on, idiot. Read what it says. Stop reading snippets out of context. Right. It says Kodesh. 
Kodesh doesn't mean new. It means renewed. Who is he renewing? And who is it with? A Gentile church or with Yisrael and Yahuda? Oops, Israel with Israel and Yahudah. with Yahudah, not with some Roman church. You're screwed. And what is the right one to. difference? I mean, there's only one difference yeah. between... He's going to write the Torah on your heart. That is correct. That so is you can't dismiss difference. the Torah with your renewed covenant because there it's you go. literally on your heart as part of the renewed that covenant. That is the only form of renewal. So for you to, to cite that... So is, there's three strikes. That, ...that you're right... You have to be ignorant and irrational. There's no excuse for ignorant and irrational. It really isn't. That's clear. Don't be so damn lazy. Think it through. And today's day and age, there is no you the excuse message. for ignorance. There isn't. Okay, for your generations to approach by way of an everlasting family covenant relationship. To approach and exist as Lahaya, your God, and also for your offspring to approach after you. Now, the only way you can have Yahweh your God is through the covenant, the one and only everlasting covenant. The only way to approach God. He has just said it there. There's one way to approach God. You want to approach God? It ain't through Easter. It ain't through Sunday. It isn't through a church. It isn't through Christmas. It isn't through a Trinity. It isn't through a prayer. It's not through an evangelist. Not through a church. Only one. By being, there's only one way to approach God, and it's through the everlasting covenant relationship as it was offered through Yahweh to Abraham and to the generations thereafter through the process of understanding. It is the only way to approach God. He's said right here, this is the way for all generations forever to approach me. It's just one verse. Barishith, in the beginning, 17.7. And you yet, know, I think a lot of religious people know. would not be religious if they studied their Bible beginning to end rather than right. bits and pieces here and there and developing, right. you know, being told what to think before actually reading it themselves. Correct. Because if you read that, there's no way you could then read Paul saying, you know, to dismiss all this and accept it. If you had read this, you'd be like, wait, wait, wait. What he's saying here is contradicting what I read here. But that's the thing is most Christians, especially when you're raised in it, you're never given a Bible to read, not till you're way older and you've already been indoctrinated with all of these things. And so then you're usually reading it bits and pieces, snippets here out of context that reinforce what you've already been told. Correct. You can't now, start a book at the end. That, that we all know that the English translations of the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms are abysmal. Oh, and yeah. It is, yeah, they suck. You know, they replace Yahweh's name with the Lord, which gives you the, leads you in the absolute wrong direction. And they don't, uh, uh, they, they replace set apart, which is a very profound term with holy. And they replace mikre, which are invitations to be called out and meet, with holy convocations. Uh, they they do everything. They, they replace Torah, which means teaching and guidance, with law. No. Uh, they do everything they can possibly do to mislead. They replace observe with keep. They replace listen with obey. And so it clearly, with all the names that they've changed, with all the terms that they've misrepresented, yeah, it's tough. But you're right. If you read the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, you will reject Christianity. There's no room for Christianity in it. If you're yeah, just, I had that conversation with someone once. I'm like, literally, if I were to go find a tribe that, you know, they, they, they speak English, but they've been cut off from the whole world. They have no idea about Christianity or any of this. And I gave them a King James Bible and came back ten years later they would not be celebrating Christianity. You could not get Christianity even from a King James Bible. That is correct. Impossible. Absolutely true. You cannot get Christianity from a King James Bible, as bad as it is. You aren't going to find you might not find the truth, but you're not going to get Christianity out of it. Yeah. Now, fellas, you know one of the nice things about uh, Pesach, Matzah, and Bakudim is you're going to start celebrating Pesach, Matzah, and Bakudim tomorrow, but guess what I'm going to be celebrating tomorrow? 
Uh-huh. Pesach uh-huh. Matzah. Matzah. Yeah, Matzah, yeah. which is really part of the same celebration. So I'm going to be celebrating it along with you, even though I started a, uh, a day before you did. Mm-hmm. By the way, I actually mm-hmm. started before, before sundown. You know, we're now at daylight savings time. And, uh, you know, it, the sun had set in Yisrael, which is really all that really matters. Uh, and uh, and so um, I, I did because I had my granddaughter over. And, and you know, they, gee, we're going to eat at, uh, at 5.30 with my granddaughter over. That's just, you know, her time. It's the right, it's the right thing yeah. for her. I'm not, and if I, did, if I waited to uh, sundown, I wouldn't do this show. So, yeah. you know, Yahweh created Pesach so that he could celebrate the, the Passover meal with his disciples and show us the proper example, and then he served as the Pesach lamb. So, uh, you know, I, I think yeah, I was just fine with the fact that I uh, did it with my family, and I did it in a way so that I could celebrate Pesach with my family and still join you all for this program tonight. So that just shows you again that I'm not into obeying, I'm not into keeping, I'm into observing and listening and making the connections to understand and then grateful for it and capitalizing upon it. And I would encourage everybody to do the same. There you go. Yeah, across the board. Well, fellas, uh, happy Pesach. Happy yes. Masa. Happy Enjoy. Bukhara. Happy Covenant. Because really this is a celebration of God opening the door to his home to invite his children inside as he makes them immortal and perfects them and adopts them into his family. That is what is happening on these three days. Fantastic. Yep. You're here. Good night. Yeah. Good night. Thank you guys. Talk to you next week. All right. Bye. Good night.